Okay, fantastic. So the recording has started. Um, warm welcome from um, both the GLI um, and the SBF teams. Um, I have um, my colleague, um, Dr. Mohammed here. Um, from SBF, um, there are a couple of other SBF colleagues in the crowd as well, such as Manal and Amr. And I think I've seen a few other names as well um, that I've that I know from our um, joint work. We are really, really excited about the webinar today, which um, is the culmination of several works, uh, several months of work together. And um, yeah, we're really just excited to share um, some of the highlights of that work with you. Um, what we have planned is um, for me, to start with some background information, some context about um, the organization that I work for, which is the JLI. And um, I will then go on to speak a little bit about the JLI SBF collaboration on MHPSS um, culture and faith in Syria. And um, after that, I will hand over to um, Mohammed, who is going to share findings of the research that we conducted um, together in the last few months. The, um, the work that we're going to speak about um, here today is um, much of it was funded by a grant um, from PART, the Partnership, Partnership for Religion and Development, um, which is hosted by GIZ. Um, at the moment, but we are also drawing on um, on more general work that SBF and JLI have been doing together in the last four years. It's been more than four years now. Um, um, before that, um, the, the partnership also involved Islamic Relief, and of course the long, very long-standing experience of SBF um, in the field of MHPSS in Syria and with Syrians and JLI's experience working with religious actors and public life. So um, yeah, that's the plan. I'm going to um, give a um, little bit of background. Mohammed is going to speak about the research findings. And then after that, um, now that he managed to join us and we've overcome the technological um, difficulties, um, Atala is then going to provide a response um, to our presentations. Um, those of you who know Atala, um, you know that he has um, many, many years of experience working um, in development, in humanitarian action, and peace building um, with a focus on faith and faith communities. Um, he's obviously been working with Islamic Relief for a long time, um, and we're just so lucky to have him here um, and to provide this response. So I'm going to start um, with my presentation then. Um, let me share my screen. Uh, if you allow me, Jennifer, just uh, uh, yes. to the language of the Arab language that has been entered in the Arab language. If you want to write it, it's called Interpretation. If you want to write it, it's called Arab language. If you want to listen to the language of the Arab language. Okay, go ahead, Jennifer. Uh, okay, all right. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, so let's see. Can you see my screen? Can you see the presentation? Yes, yes. Or... Okay, okay, fantastic. All right. So, um, so the um the project that we're going to speak about today is, um, as I've mentioned, focuses on MHPSS, which um, stands for mental health and psych psychosocial support, um, culture and faith in the Syrian context. And um, what we did, so that's the topic. And then in terms of the methodology, the specific approach that we adopted to this work is, um, that was a research capacity sharing 
approach. Um, and I'll go more into detail um, in the next couple of minutes. So as I said, I will speak first a little bit, little bit about the rationale of our work together. Um, I will then tell you a little bit about um, my organization, the JLI, which is short for Joint Learning Initiative on Faith and Local Communities. After that, um, I'll give some background on the MHPSS Culture and Faith Hub, um, focusing on Syria that SBF and JLI set up um, a bit more than a year ago. I'll speak about the aims of our work together and the methodology. So in terms of why we're doing what we're doing, um, it all started with SPF um, identifying a significant gap in the research and evidence on culturally responsive and face sensitive approaches to MHPSS in the Syrian context. So SPF, they are obviously MHPSS um, professionals who have long-standing experience in the in this area. And um, Mohammed will be able to say more about that, but um, there was basically a frustration that either there was no research or not enough research or the research was produced, but then it was not disseminated. So people were not actually aware that there was research out there. And then quite often research also focused on um, on um, MHPSS outside of the Syrian context. Yeah, so this is something that we know, um, we all know from other contexts, a lot of the research that is out, out there tends to be dominated by Western actors, um, by academics that are affiliated with, um, um, with European or North American um, universities that just have, um, amounts of research funding that people in other parts of the world can just um, dream of, let alone, of course, um, um, non-academics, right? Practitioners who don't um, have an affiliation with academic um, institutions. And um, yeah, that, that, was, um, that was one of the issues that SBF um, identified. And then of course also, whoops, sorry. And then of course also, a lack of transfer of knowledge between research, practice, policy, and communities. Um, major issue um, it was and continues to be this dominance of experts from outside of Syria or Syrian communities in the region. And again, this is something that um, we also, we all know, um, there, there, there's just a tendency um, of research programs to rely on researchers that are being brought in from the outside. Yeah, so we, it, yes, we do research on um, MHPS and in Syria, and that's great, and that's much needed. But rather than, than either hiring a Syrian researcher or working with Syrian communities and with Syrian practitioners to produce this research together, what often happens is that you have, I don't know, let's say a British or a French or a US American researcher who has flown into um, the region, do their research and then they leave again. And um, which often leaves Syrians themselves with very little, um, with very little agency to shape the research, decide what are priorities, decide how the research should be conducted, um, and then also what how the research should be used. Um, so really, really big problem. Um, and SPF wanted to change that. Now, SPF, luckily, we're friends with JLI. <laughs> JLI, or as I mentioned, um, the Joint Learning Initiative on Faith and Local Communities, which is a network of now over 1,100 
researchers, um, policymakers, and practitioners that focus on learning and evidence. So we, what we are trying to do um, is to, um, to produce research and evidence and then disseminate research and evidence on religions and religious actors in international development, in humanitarian action, in peace building and other types of community work. But we don't just want to produce that research, but we also want to produce it in ways that are fair and equitable. Okay, so that's the that's the point that links back to what I was just saying about this um, issue that um, SBF identified, um, which is obviously an issue um, in um, in this kind of work more broadly. Um, and that's something that at JLI we try to do differently. We want to get away from research on Syria that's dominated by non-Syrians. We want to get away from yet another panel on what is the issue in Syria. And then you look at the panel and you have five non-Syrians sitting there. Like where are the voices of Syrians? And I'm giving examples now from Syria because that's relevant to the work that um, we have been doing with SBF. But of course, this applies across the board. And um, JLI does not just work in um, Syria and the region, but we have similar work happening in um, East Africa, for example, in Southeast Asia, um, um, in, in, in Latin America, in various parts of the world. The, the, the reason why we're focusing on religions is that when JLI was set up, over 10 years ago now. Um, it was set up by a group of people who worked with international organizations and with big NGOs, with international NGOs, um, and who were quite frustrated that a lot of the approaches um, by people who work in these organizations were extremely secular, so secular that there was just no place left for anything to do with religion. And religion was um, regarded as something bad, either irrelevant, who cares about religion, or something bad. And what these approaches completely overlooked was the fact that actually religion and culture is really important for lots of people around the world. And um, it's, not, it's not a matter of... Um, um, it's not a matter of um, of having um, of um, promoting religious approaches regardless of the context. No, but if there is a context where actually religious and secular actors can work together, then why should we pretend that one of them didn't exist? So that's that's what we do at GLI. We try and build spaces where we can together in fair and equitable ways create and then share research and evidence on the role of religions um, in development you maintain in action, peace building and community work. We, our aim is to strengthen partnerships between people of different backgrounds, people um, who, um, who, for whom religion is important, people for whom religion is not relevant, um, people who work locally and internationally. And the way we do this is through some, something that we call shared learning hubs, which are basically working groups of researchers, practitioners, and policymakers who have a shared interest in one topic that could be um, MHPSS, like in the case of um, in the case of um, this work together with um, SBF. Or it could be migration or gender-based violence or conflict and peace. Um, and these are all examples for other hubs that um, we have um, set up in the past. And these hubs could be global hubs where people from all over the world join, or there could be regional hubs where you have people from one specific region or local hubs where you really just have people from one specific context. 
Now, our work with SBF is an example of, I suppose, either a local or regional hub, because um, the hub that we set up is um, for Syrians. It's, it's run by Syrians with the support of GLI in the background, advising on the research side of things. Um, and then SPF run the hub itself um, and engage with members of the Syrian community, M MHPS, uh, people who work on MHPSS, either as MHPSS professionals or as NGO practitioners with a focus on, um, on MHPSS. And what we did is we added this, um, we added the specific focus on culture. And when we say culture, we mean culture, faith, traditions, customs. Yeah, so it's quite a broad um, focus on culture. Um, I've already mentioned that we, um, we have been working on the hub for one year now. We first um, got a small grant from um, GLI. Geneva, 20, 2022, not 23. Oh, sorry. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you, Mohammed. Yeah, so we have been around for one year and one month, not just one month. <laughs> um, we first we first got um, a grant from GLI um, with funding from um, the GHR Foundation, which is a foundation that's based in the US. And then the second grant from PART, the Partnership for Religions and Development um, that I mentioned before. And um, yeah, as I, as I said, what was really, really important for us with this work was to have a fair and equitable approach whereby GLI and SBF work together as partners um, as, much, um, as much on an equal footing as possible. Um, of course, there are still power dynamics that do exist and we can't change them. Um, that's just the reality of our work, but what we try and do in this partnership um, and our other um, work is just to reduce it's just to reduce this as much as possible and it's been a process it's been a process of learning of exchange of dialogue um, where we hold each other to account and we tell each other when we think something went well or we think think something maybe um, this is something where we need to um, adopt our approach. Now, the project that we're going to sp um, speak about today had two aims. Um, the first one was to strengthen the leadership of Syrian MHPSS practitioners, um, specifically with a focus on culturally responsive and face sensitive approaches. Yeah, so that's this gap that um, we said um, SPF identified um, and that they wanted to contribute to addressing. That was one, one, um, one thing that was really important for us. And the way we wanted to do that um, was through um, producing and sharing research and evidence on culturally responsive and face sensitive MHPSS um, approaches in col um, collaborative and equitable, fair and equitable ways. That's um, that that was that was why um, why we um, set out um, to do this work. Now, our methodology reflects that. Our methodology reflects these aims. Um, so if you look at the activities that we implemented, you'll see that um, there was an important awareness raising um, element. So we used the funding to, we had to consolidate the new um, shared learning hub on MHPSS and culture. So um, by the time that we started this work in the summer of last year, we had already set up the hub with the small, the first small grant that we got. Um, and SPF then continued to organize information and awareness raising and discussion meetings that looked at the role of culture, faith, and traditions in MHPSS work in a Syrian context. 
And that's really where a lot of this work um, starts, right? By just having a conversation in a context where secular approaches are um, considered the norm and where there is not really much space to consider um, the role of culture and faith or not, not much evidence on it either. <laughs> so we will hear from Mohammed in a moment that actually people are doing things to make sure that their work is culturally responsive and face sensitive, but there's not, not much formal reflection on that. There's not much of a discussion. So that's that was a really important part of the work. And then um, we came to the research element. Um, we conducted three trainings um, of Syrian MHPSS professionals um, and NGO workers on research methods. They were done online. Um, I, I was the facilitator and we had um, a group of um, Syrian practitioners in the meeting with us. Um, and this was then followed by the data collection phase whereby these um, Syrian practitioners who were trained in research methods then went out to do interviews um, with other MHPSS professionals. and. Um, what they focused on was the extent to which global MHPSS approaches are and can be adapted to the Syrian context. After that, um, data analysis um, took place in a collaborative um, process whereby um, SPF started the, um, started the analysis and then there was a feedback loop um, involving JLI and it went back and forth a few times. And we are currently working um, on the completion of our research outputs, um, which involve a policy and practice paper, an academic paper. Um, and then we also have our two events. So a local workshop and an international webinar You'll be pleased to hear that this is the international webinar, so you're part of it. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was a quick um, overview from my side about um, the background um, and specific approach of our joint work. I um, would now hand over to Mohammed so that he can actually share with us the findings of the research, which is quite exciting. I don't think they have been shared publicly um, yet. You are the first ones to hear from Mohammed. Mohammed, are you okay to share your screen or do you want me to share from my side? Yes, uh, I'm, I'm opening the file now. Okay. Uh, let me just see. Do you see my screen now? It's still black. Yes, now we can see it. Okay. So thank you, Jennifer, for this introduction and the background about our work. And for sake of time, I'll be uh, more faster in the presentation. So for in, uh, our colleague in, in interpretation, take care of that. So I welcome everybody for joining us in this webinar. Um, just to, to mention about SPF, so we are a uh, uh, non-governmental and profit uh, humanitarian organization. We are specialized in mental health and psychosocial support. We started working in Syria, then we moved to Jordan then to Gaziantep, Turkey. Uh, we work to integrate MHPSS, mental health and psychosocial support services and activities into other humanitarian sectors like protection, nutrition, health and education. We also work in protection and empowerment of women, children and adolescents, as well as persons with disabilities and other vulnerable groups. Uh, SPF provide high quality capacity building and supervision services. And it is interested in research and innovation 
in the humanitarian and development sector. And we value the importance of advocacy, system thinking, and community-based approaches to drive change and to achieve impact that is cost-effective and sustainable. As we know that disasters and wars have a lasting psychological and social effects on people's lives, particularly in the global South. Mental health programs and psychological support are needed to address these effects. However, many programs are developed by people from foreign universities and institutions from global North, if you call it. It is important to consider the local culture and adapt programs accordingly. Failure to do so can result in inappropriate programs being implemented in societies with different cultures. This can lead to no effectiveness or sometimes can lead to harm. Our research uh, has identified a general problems with mental health and psychosocial support programs in the Syrian context. These programs are sometimes not appropriate for the context and current programs of mental health lack tangible measures of success beyond the number of beneficiaries included in reports. There's a need to measure the extent to which these programs improve the resilience of families and societies and have long-term impact. And maybe one cause of that we are not able to get a result that we want is that it is not culturally adapted. So um, what we did is we did an interview with the 20 mental health workers uh, and specialists. And we asked him a set of questions and we got the answers. So briefly what we found is First, lack of understanding of cultural adaptation. So cultural adaptation was not well established or clear among mental health workers. So when we talk about cultural adaptation, they didn't know what uh, we meant by that. Then when we explain, then they start to give examples. And there is the, a lack of specific approaches and mechanism for cultural adaptation process in target context, which is like Syrian context. Uh, some workers implement cultural adaptation, but the examples provided are often superficial and don't reflect the necessary level of adaptation required. Another problem is lack of holistic approach. Only half, uh, about half of participants supported the idea of including spiritual counselor in MHPS teams. So they were reluctant to, to accept this idea that the team of MHPSs can have a, a spiritual counselor. Uh, many providers, mental health providers, avoid dealing with uh, jurisprudential issues, or what, what we call in Arabic, al-umur uh, al-fiqhiyya. That is related to life of their clients. Uh, and this shows the lack of awareness of the interdependence of different aspects of person's life and their impact uh, on each other. We found uh, some resistance to cultural adaptation. Some participants resisted the idea of cultural adaptation and believe that Western curricula is scientifically proven and does not require any changes. And some Mental health workers practiced unprofessional and immoral behaviors in the name of neutrality. So they were forcing some people uh, like, like to see maybe a counselor from uh, other six. So this was against their willingness. Uh, and they said that this is an example of neutrality. There was also a training gaps Despite numerous trainings uh, uh, that uh, these mental health workers has re received uh, from UN agencies, INGOs, Syrian NGOs, cultural adaptation was not given adequate attention, if it at all. Uh, and 60% of participants has requested that they need the training on appropriate cultural adaptation mechanism 
to improve mental health programs in community. So our recommendation that I will tell now is based on, on two phases. Uh, one phase, one, one activity that we, uh, we, we have done is we did a scoping study uh, to review all the research that talked about uh, cultural adaptation of mental health to Syrian context. And then we did the research that we talked about uh, uh, with the meeting with the 20 mental health workers. And this is not only a recommendation, but also it is uh, for us actually to work on in our hub. First, we, we think we need a paradigm shift. We need to adopt a different paradigm when discussing the role of culture and faith in mental health and psychosocial problems among Syrians. So it is not only small, uh, small adaptation, like to use some names or some uh, activities that is related to culture. It is what we, we suggest that we need to think about it as a, as a way of like a philosophy of life. And this is very important for like Syrians because faith and culture uh, uh, serves as a, a way of life, uh, not only part of their life. We need to empower Syrians to have critical attitudes, to be able to form theories about their own matters and to challenge prevailing theories. We need to encourage a self-criticism approach to culture to define harmful cultural practices and provide more suitable approaches. Like this is also very important. There's some unacceptable cultural practices in mental health that we need to discover and we need to correct. So not everything in culture is right. Uh, so we need to, uh, to see what are there and how we can modify the harmful uh, practices and promote the uh, positive practices. We need to uh, address belief in magic and position by jinn and other cultural related topics in innovative ways. In research, we uh, recommend that we need to establish mental health and culture radar to capture any research article or blog regarding senior mental health. We need to explore wider liter liter uh, literature that includes the works of scientists from over 1,000 years ago and liter uh, literature that talks about mental health and culture in other Arabic and Muslim countries. So in history, in our history, in culture, there was a lot of work of scientists uh, uh, like hundreds of years ago. And we need to rethink about and reread these uh, uh, writings. We need to conduct more research on importance of cultural adaptation of mental health programs and its impact on improving mental health of Syrians. And we need to find ways to encourage uptake of research findings that bypass filters. So not only publishing the results, but taking it to become, become a practical uh, in, in, in humanitarian work. Uh, training and curriculum development, we recommend that we need training local researchers uh, in qualitative research, which is suitable for this type of research. Training mental health professionals and their organization teams on the principles of cultural adaptation and raising their awareness about the importance of this. Training spiritual counselors and involve them in the mental health and psychosocial support services develop specific approaches and mechanism for the cultural adaptation process and building new culturally adapted curricula and supporting their dissemination. And the last, uh, from the uh, perspective of partnership, coordination and awareness raising, we recommend that it needed that to, to raise awareness about cultural adaptation through media, advocacy and outreach activity and addressing deep cultural topics and resistance to cultural adaptation. We need to involve religious leaders in the process of cultural adaptation of mental health programs, linking mental health professionals to rareable religious bodies. And we need to focus on coordination 
a mental health field establishing specialized leadership in Syria to organize and govern it and involving all stakeholders in it. This is, was my recommendation and uh, thank you for your listening. Uh, Jennifer. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Um... I mean, I, I was involved in the research from the very beginning, right? We were planning it together and then we prepared it and um, I conducted the research training um, and have been following all of this work from the very beginning um, up until now, but it's still so fascinating to hear it um, from you summarized. So thank you so much for that. Um, we um, now have um, some time to hear from our colleague and friend Atalla who I see is getting ready um, to share his reflections. Um, Atala? Yeah, yeah before, uh, before Atala speak, because I want to emphasize that we have worked with uh, Atala uh, with Islamic Relief on a project before this project, where we uh, looked to, into the factors that help Syrian women, uh, uh, like uh, spiritual or religious factors that help traumatize Syrian women to overcome their trauma. So yeah, it was like a very great partnership with uh, Brother Atalla and Islamic Relief. And yeah, I would like to thank him for that opportunities that opened the door for us in this field. So thank you, Atalla, and you got, go ahead and yeah. Mark, well, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Mohammed and, and Jennifer for this opportunity um, to hear about your research. And it's really so, um, heartening to see how the journey has moved on um, in terms of uh, SBF's work around uh, engaging and dealing with this issue about cultural adaptation because uh, this was something that sparked off in me some eight maybe eight years ago um, having been having been a being a Muslim and engaging in our evaluating our uh, MHPSS psychosocial responses uh, to crises, I recognize this gap uh, that um, often our staff were being trained by Western and Northern European um, colleagues in very good methodologies, sound methodologies, but the fact that they were unable to adapt to the inclusion of faith and, and cultural meaning uh, meant that potentially there was an element of harm, um, but perhaps that wasn't the main issue. It was the fact that uh, they were unable to leverage the power of religious healing and concepts. And um, many of the colleagues on this call, I'm sure, will appreciate that within the Muslim context, there is very much a kind of parallel conceptual framework around mental health uh, that, that relates to Islamic teaching on the self and on um, the intersection between spiritual health and mental health uh, and the, the impossibility of of separating those out uh, and the impact of one over the other so very often as you will appreciate our mental stress affects our spiritual health and sometimes spiritual stress affects our mental health um, and islam also has a parallel cosmology around the self in terms of its understanding of the spirit uh, and its connection to the heart and to the intellect, which is deeply thought out and, and scientific. There's a whole science in Islamic teaching around the understanding of the self, which is based in the science of Tasawwuf. Um, and Syria being a, <clears throat> a traditional Muslim society, uh, much of that knowledge will be um, endemic in the community. Uh, and so it's critically important that we don't create these parallel worlds 
where religion is somehow denied or ignored and and there's a lot of harm that can happen from that um you know if children for instance are being talked to about mental health concepts and they go home and they get a completely different discourse uh, from their parents then that's not going to be helpful and can lead to damaging effects so uh, Muhammad's talk about cultural adaptation is absolutely relevant in our context and we've been working um, you know since we produced the, the overall guidelines on um, face sensitive mental health which Muhammad translated into Arabic we then did a two-year research looking at trauma uh, amongst Muslim women particularly as well as some Christian women um, and and this latest research uh, builds on on that so i think um some of the some of the issues that are complex and need to be addressed is issues of stigma um that um within as we discovered in our research but as muslims would probably know um you know, there may be a stigma around mental health issues, which it's difficult for people to accept. Um, and so part of the adaptation is, is creating understanding. And this is very much about the localization element of, of the research. Um, and, and how do we get local groups to internalize uh, and to adapt and to build on their indigenous, indigenous knowledge, uh, recognizing that there are, as Mohammed, uh, Dr. Mohammed quite rightly uh, mentioned, while religion has a lot to offer, it can also, um, mainly through lack of knowledge um, and lack of guidance, lead to problems as well. Uh, in mental health issues, and and it's that cutting edge. Where, where, you know, our colleagues in 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 the Muslim world need to be so smart because they have to they have to be able to deal with this these very complex issues. Um, that health, spirituality, and religion can also create problems in relation to mental health if there's insufficient guidance. And so it's about building on people with knowledge in the community. And that may not only be mental health professionals, but scholars uh, and sheikhs and people who are uh, able to approach issues uh, that intersect between religion and mental health. And a, a colleague, mentioned a few years ago a typical issue was that he was he was referred by a hospital in the uk as somebody who had extraordinary deep stress a stress and trauma and he was he was referred to a muslim counselor who worked for the nhs trust and that muslim counselor was able to diagnose this patient as suffering from extreme fear of divine punishment. Um, and <clears throat> I, I'm not aware of what that person had done or what he felt guilty about, but it had caused him to be in such a state that he was in an extreme state of depression and that was affecting his physical health. Now in the context of something like Syria and conflict and the, the, the incredibly traumatic issues that Mohammed and his staff and colleagues must be coming across every day. This is absolutely critically important. What, for instance, if somebody had shot somebody in a conflict and then he was assailed by guilt and all of these issues. And so with some work, um, this counselor was able to counsel this gentleman about Islamic teaching around forgiveness and about repentance and 
and, and he returned to normality and he started to engage again with his friends and community. So th this gives an example of some of the complexity, but also the power and importance. And I think many of us would agree the absolute um, <laughs> obligation for us to combine um, if we're going to be effective and thoughtful and responsible mental health practitioners, which I, I'm not a mental health practitioner, but I, I recognize that this is important. And, and my respect really goes out to Mohammed for recognizing this deep problem, which um, in, in, in some contexts within the Arab world, unfortunately, psychologists and psychotherapists are trained in Western um, paradigms. Uh, and they then, that causes conflict within them and they end up um, actually disagreeing or not actually accepting Islamic teaching ar around the self and around spiritual realities. Like that there was a, um, a psychiatrist, for instance, that I, I met a Syrian psychiatrist in the UK who denied the existence of jinn. I mean, he was a practicing Muslim, but he wasn't able to accept some of the, the concepts in Islam around the unseen. So it, 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 it's, it's very damaging. And what it requires is, as Mohammed and Jennifer have said, is a lot of research, uh, a lot of research and development um, and engaging between these two worlds, the world of, of, of spirituality and spiritual knowledge and how that relates to the self and the, and the very real problem of how we deal with mental health and psychosocial problems emerging from crises. Um, and the, you know, both communities have a huge amount to share with each other. And I'm, um, you know, seeing that through my wife's work. My wife is a mental health She's a psychotherapist, but she's also a chaplain, what we call in the UK a, a chaplain. So she provides pastoral care within hospitals in the UK. Um, <clears throat> and I've learned so much through her that actually religion can be, faith can be so well supported by mental health practice. And, the practice of pastoral care and chaplaincy is not necessarily a religious one, it's around listening. And funnily enough, in the research that we did with Mohammed, um, that we, through Mohammed's colleagues, it was one of the researchers noted that actually one of the, the women that uh, he or she was interviewing said that actually just the fact that that person was able to speak one-on-one -on -one with the researcher was a huge benefit to her. It enabled her to unload, to, um, to relieve herself in some way. Um, the, 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 the last thing, I, 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 don't, I, I feel guilty because Mohammed, Mohammed's work had so much depth and each paragraph that he put on the screen, I felt that we needed to talk just about that paragraph. <laughs> so there, there is so rich um, that I don't really know where to start in responding to this, but I, I will finish with this emphasis that um, there is a huge amount to learn and, and to build on in our practice. Uh, and 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 this issue that religion, for instance, one of the things we learned through the research was that <clears throat> that women necessarily coming together to talk about their common problem wasn't necessarily helpful to them, or reassurance from friends and Muslim brothers and sisters you know, about their loss and about their faith, etc., wasn't necessarily helpful to them. Um, you know, so sometimes what we think will be helpful from a religious perspective isn't. And this is where 
you know, this critical area of research will enable us to build on it. So necessarily, for instance, providing a safe space for women who've been raped or sexually molested to come together to talk about their problem and to share it won't necessarily be helpful. We have to start off with a people-centered approach um, and, and, and listen, uh, you know, listen to the, the, the people first. Uh, and so, so yeah, I'm going to stop there because I could honestly, Dr. Mohammed has sparked me off. I could talk all day about this, his work um, and how important it is. But I think it's important that we get some sharing from the audience uh, of colleagues, I'm sure, who've got much deeper experience than I have of this. And also questions to Mohammed. Um, I mean, one of my questions is, you know, how, how can we, how has he been able to deal with um, identifying people within the community who are able to offer partnership with him in identifying sufferers uh, and referring them uh, for his services, um, which is just one of the questions I would have. Um, and this is very much about the issue of localization and empowerment and enabling religious leaders and other actors to understand mental health at a deeper level, um, at a clinical level, um, and not just from a spiritual level. Over, I'll hand back to uh, Jennifer and to Mohammed. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Atala. So we knew what we were doing um, when we decided to work with all of you. Um, so, mashallah, we got deep, deep, deep input from Muhammad, rich input, um, and now deep and rich response from um, Atala. So thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, we do have time now for questions, for responses, and that could really be from anyone um, on the call here today. Uh, I already see the first hand up. Shall we just hand over to the first um Response. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. If you still have time, so you can speak. Inshallah, I have like 30 seconds that I need to go another meeting. I just wanted to say that I'm so excited about this meeting and I want to really thank Dr. Mohammed Abu Hilal, Syrian Bright Future. Also, I saw that Islam and Relief is involved in the research and also joint learning initiative. I just got to know this in organization. And I really want to thank all brothers and sisters who are joining here, whether you're mental health professionals or generally curious and cultural adaptive modalities when it comes to mental health and psychosocial and spiritual support, of course. My name is Sayyid Jamaluddin Miri. I just briefly introduced myself. I'm a co-founder and director of ISIP, the International Students of Islamic Psychology, also one of the founders of Al-Balkhi Institute of Islamic Psychological Studies and Research. And we're also establishing a mental health support counseling services online, which is called Rafiq Counseling, where we're combining Western trained and mainstream psychology practitioners like myself, I'm a counselor. We have psychiatrists, psychologists, psychotherapists, etc., with those that are trained in Islamic psychology as well. Uh, so what we're trying to do is to offer services that are culturally adaptive and both culturally and religious sensitive uh, from a very uh, human uh, oriented approach. Uh, and we are at your service. We have local and regional chapters all over the world. We have a lot of access to great, excellent research, empirical research done by some of the leading scholars in the field. We have a lot of access to resources of how to apply cultural sensitive and religious sensitive and culture adaptive modalities and mental health support towards refugees and migrants, etc. As you know, most migrants in the West are Muslims, right? So it's a very good to have that involved. But of course, there is cultural adaptive sensitive approaches and Christian approaches, Jewish approaches and other religious or even secular spiritual domains like act, acceptance, commitment, therapy, and how can you use it 
for Islamic population. We have a lot of research on that. One of our colleagues, Dr. Ahmed Tahan, is one of the leading scholars on how to use ACT, which is the third wave cognitive behavior therapy and positive psychology for Muslim uh, population as well. So we are very open to integrate, interact with fellow colleagues from other faith tradition or even, even people that are agnostics or atheists. That's perfectly fine. And how we can collaborate together for the benefit of uh, Syrian refugees or other refugee population as well. We see a lot of wisdom, both in the Western tradition of psychology, like for instance, positive psychology, humanistic psychology, logotherapy. My recent research was about how to utilize logotherapy working with Muslims, because logotherapy is an amazing therapeutic approach where you can find meaning from suffering, which actually Dr. Atallah, may Allah uh, bless you, Dr. Atallah, you were speaking about finding meaning in trials and tribulation. In Islamic tradition, we call it bala, right? To understand meaning in trials and tribulation for post-traumatic growth. This is something that I'm very passionate about, both in my own research, but also as a practitioner. So ISIP is at your service. We want to build bridges with both Muslims and non-Muslims because Islamic psychology is not only for Muslims. This is insights from thousand years of scholarship that even non-Muslims can benefit from, even Western psychology can benefit from. And we're integrating this with our training in Western modalities and mainstream psychology modalities. We have a lot of resources, a lot of colleagues that will be at your service. I need to go, but Dr. Muhammad Hilal is my own brother and he's my colleague and he is my mentor and teacher. So he will, he knows more about us. I put my details in the chat and I'm looking forward to support this. We need this sisters and brothers. This is so important, not only in Syria. I live in Sweden where majority of the refugees are from Syria or Iran or Iraq or Afghanistan or Somalia. And when they go to mental health providers that don't understand cultural sensitive approach, then they don't go there after a while. And instead they will still have their mental health issues. So we need to do advocacy for a culturally sensitive approach, cultural adaptive approach, because this is a way to break the stigma of dealing with mental health that we have in Muslim population and in other minority population due to racism, discrimination, we see and faced it. UK actually, uh, Dr. Atala, is much uh, further along than Sweden and many other Western countries. So we learn a lot from the UK because they have, for instance, Muslim chaplaincy. I heard that you said that your wife was a chaplain, mashallah. This is an amazing profession. But uh, there is a lot of need both in the diaspora and in the field. So I want to thank you all for listening. It's an honor to be with you. And I'm looking forward to be part of more meetings. And please forgive me for any shortcomings for my brief presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brother Jamal Dean. Thank you very much for this uh, introduction and comments. And hopefully we can engage uh, all together in, in next, inshallah, webinars and, and work. Thank you very much. Inshallah. Uh, and we open now for others, everybody who want to ask questions, he can either use the chat or raise his hand. I want just to uh, uh, mention that the guidelines that developed by Brother Atallah, Islamic Relief and Lutheran Federation, uh, I put the link on the chat so you can see the guidelines about how to integrate, uh, integrate faith in mental health and protection programs. So just this is for your reference. And also there was a question uh, uh, to Brother Atallah, what did you mean by spiritual stress? Uh, uh, so if you if you briefly answer this question, when you said uh, uh, spiritual stress. Yeah, so um, just as the mind uh, gets uh, affected by events, so does the spirit. Um, and the spirit um, can, you know, feel stress from a whole range of things, including, for instance, if uh, one has done something, say, like a serious sin, some, 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 murdered somebody or taken somebody's life uh, without, uh, without right, that can deeply affect one, uh, the spirit. Um, and that in turn affects causing mental distress so there's this symbiotic within the islamic teaching there's a symbiotic relationship between the spirit which is a, a, affected a, affected which has the um uh, is essentially um, your connection to god in relation to its its that part of you which is uh, able to gain spiritual insight um, and meaning. 
um, and the mind, which is uh, essentially works um, through cognitive um, uh, processes, which processes meaning from outside. So part of us is processing meaning from inside and part of it is processing meaning from outside. So in the Islamic teaching, it's in incredibly important that the two are synchronized and the two, the, the, the person is treated as a whole person, both the spirit and the mind. Uh, and in the example I gave, you know, if, if, if say somebody had within a, a war situation had undergone a, an extremely traumatic or perhaps an extremely sinful event which then put them into what I would say is a spiritual trauma. In, in other words, it, they felt their relationship to God uh, was, was harmed uh, and uh, they were overcome with sort of grief and, um, uh, and, and trauma. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's, I hope I've explained it adequately. Thank you very much. That uh, was from Ursula, I think, the question, so you answered that. So can you just repeat your question to me? So for, um, I'm not sure if it was clear for me, you asked me how I reach people. So in general, uh, I mean, there's a lot of organizations who work in psychosocial support in the Syrian context right? But there was no uh, spiritual component, official spiritual or faith component in that. And what we found that there's some people who practice some elements of faith uh, or use some of these techniques, but without any training or guidelines or supervision. Um, and uh, the research we done is was with uh, mental health workers not with the uh, uh, beneficiaries, okay? Uh, so I'm not sure about your question, if you want to phrase it. Brother Atallah. The, the, my question to, to you. Yes, your question to me. Okay, yeah, the, the original question was, um, you know, how have you, how successful have you been in, sensitizing um, traditional Muslim scholars, imams, and um, faith actors within the community, to put a broad term, and they may yeah. be sort of midwives or whoever it is, um, to, to concepts of mental health, uh, identifying mental health illness as conditions and and uh, approaching the complexity of, of of diagnosis really uh and avoiding the pitfalls of people diagnosing them for spiritual concerns where they're not where they're mental and the other way around <laughs> yeah um i look i ironically i will say that i found that faith people were more acceptance to for mental health and psychosocial support perspectives than I found the uh, mental health professionals to accept including faith component in mental health. So, so this is actually what I noticed in, in working. Uh, so, and this opened an opportunities, big opportunities actually, if we can reach for these faith leaders, and then educate them about mental health, I think we will have uh, multiple effects or multiplied effects, right? A synergy, because they will be easily accepting mental health perspectives. Uh, we can easily correct some misconception and even some misconception, misconception from religious perspective from faith perspectives, there's misunderstanding or misinterpretation for some uh, maybe, uh, uh, you know, ver uh, Quran verses or, or, or hadith, right? It was easy to, to negotiate with them and correct that. And this can, if we are able to do that, they can then spread 
the concept about mental health through uh, uh, Friday ceremonies, through teaching uh, uh, Quran courses, right? Uh, I think there's a big opportunities. What I found is there's a resistance uh, from mental health professionals to do that for uh, several reasons. Uh, um, one prominent is fearing from the donors if you go and work with these faith leaders. Uh, second, there's, they don't have uh, any means, any curriculums, any trainings to do that, right? Uh, and also they fear from some maybe negative uh, practices if they will start to, to open this door. Uh, so, so this is what I found on, on, on reality. So there is an opportunity, big opportunities to, to change the whole mental health approach in Syria context. But we still need to convince people who are uh, gatekeepers, uh, let's say, and donors, and maybe uh, 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 big uh, names in, in mental health to accept that and start to support that. I don't know if this answers your question, but this yes. is actually what I wanted to say. Yes, that's that's really interesting, um, and particularly exciting that you found people open um, to, um, to, 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 to tr trying to um, open to understanding mental health as, as clinical conditions and not, and, and not just uh, sort of tr traditional perceptions of mental health because there is this often this massive stigma which we hear about in the community uh, around fearing that mental health is to do with weakness or it's to do with uh, spiritual w uh, problems or um, gin or something else. Um, and so the, the first step really is, is to build um, understanding uh, and education uh, but also, I thought it was very interesting what you were talking about, uh, critical thinking, um, challenging um, prevailing themes, uh, self-critical approach. Um, you know, there's, there's, it's, it's incredibly important to, um, to do this work. And I, um, I, I was really interested what um, my brother said Jim um, was saying, uh, and his work in Sweden. And, and interestingly, uh, I think I, I tried to message um, you recently uh, because we are looking to try and build alliances in building a service in humanitarian response that would include mental health uh, support uh, and pastoral care. Uh, and it's quite a challenging journey because uh, most humanitarian agencies are terrified about uh, getting involved in religious advice. Um, mm. And because of all the pitfalls that they could be accused of, um, prostatism, of exploiting people's vulnerability. Um, and so, um, you know, it's been quite difficult to get funding and uh, recognition and agencies willing to take the risk of getting involved in this. Um, yeah. And uh, that's why Islamic Relief are looking for professionals such as yourself, uh, Sir Jaranadine and, and others to get involved uh, so that we can ensure that uh, pastoral support can be also tied to clinical referral and counseling at a, at a, at a deeper level um, within the area so that we can create connected routes. But what we discovered through our research with, uh, in Syria was that actually a lot of victims just want to be, they just want to be listened to. No. They want to unburden, they want a safe space 
to talk about what happened to them that's non-judgmental um, and that is supportive. And that should be our first step as uh, from the Muslim community to try and provide that. And so I feel a sense of duty uh, to try and build this as part of our humanitarian response. So I, I'd welcome any networking that we could do after this call uh, with colleagues to try and do this. Over. Yeah, inshallah, inshallah. And I want actually to emphasize because this is like very, very, very sad that in humanitarian work, it is like a big bureaucratic machine that also there's a good intentions, but when they, when they go to do relief efforts, it is easy, right? But when it comes to topics like mental health, it needs a lot of um, complexity in thinking and flexibility and innovation. And unfortunately, we don't find that in donors, either big donors or, or INGOs because they were ever overwhelmed with the requirement of the day-to-day -day work and reporting and financial and money and all these things uh, to the degree that nobody is like, you know, uh, have time to think about how we go. And, and the result is you do mental health projects year after year after year after year. But when you see after 10 years, what did we achieve? Did we have really an impact? or not. So this is need to be brought to the table that now we need to think about long term impact. You did not achieve what you promised or what you aimed at in the beginning. So this is actually one of the challenges that we have problem with the donors. And you see that money are spent in a way that can have some activities, right? A lot of numbers, but are there any real impacts? This is like doubtful, uh, I think. So yeah, this is a problem. I think this is a cause that we need to, all of us work together, try to maybe uh, change. And this is need a paradigm shift as we as we said, yeah. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, we have a question from um, Michelle in the chat. Michelle, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question directly? Thank you very much. I'm enjoying this uh, webinar. It's wonderful what your the research you've you've done and the uh, recommendations you have. Uh, Mr. Fitzgibbons, when you mentioned the deep spiritual stress and internal conflict that people may have after some experience, it it made me think of moral injury which is a newer concept, but has many people even call it spiritual injury because they're, they're in, in the case of um, in the military, it was identified in the US. So uh, men and women who have engaged in conflict and then perhaps have killed someone and then they have this uh, stress that just seems to be so intractable. And now that it's being recognized that it's such a profound internal shattering of faith and the whole perspective uh, of the, you know, one's world um, perspective on the world, spiritually speaking, and God, that it, it's like psychology hasn't always gone to the spiritual to which like we've identified here is not just an aspect of personality but is the ground of being for all other aspects and dimensions of personality so um yeah this can be a shattering experience but for many people who are involved in wars for example so as conflicts are everywhere uh i think this is just an indication of the track that you all are on and, and the joint learning initiative is so needed. So thank you. But if you have comments, I don't know if, if this is a helpful concept or not, or has been explored. That was my question. Uh, I, I just respond quickly, Michelle. Thank you so much for your 
uh, contribution, and, and that's so interesting. Um, you know, I, I recognize that cultures are different, and it's important to recognize cultural difference. Recently, we were attempting to get a consortium going in the humanitarian community around uh, spiritual care. And I learned that in the United States, uh, the American Red Cross provide disaster spiritual care. I had heard this and, uh, and I was interested in learning from them on how we could develop a model which would be acceptable uh, to the international community. So we had several sessions with um, the sort of uh, director and head of learning, et cetera. Uh, and it was so interesting that spiritual care in a humanitarian crisis emerged essentially from a demand from people affected, which makes you realize the difference, the cultural difference within the United States to Europe, in that in Europe, people are not encouraged uh, and are in denial around uh, so, sort of sp spirituality often uh, and its impact. They don't understand it. We're, we're victims of uh, of sort of 60 years of, of, of uh, secular uh, mindset and domination of our education systems, etc. So it's almost like people are embarrassed to talk about that. That it's you know the the, the thought of as anti intellectual, um, and yet in the states where culture um, and religion are so much more entwined and accepted and there's such a greater acceptance. Um, it was interesting what a colleague from the Red Cross said that actually victims of disaster would say, look, well, you know, we need, we need spiritual counseling. You, you know, they, they had the agency uh, and the spiritual awareness because of the higher level of religiosity and its and its acceptance within American discourse, they had the confidence to, to demand and ask for that. Uh, whereas in Europe, it's like we're sort of, you know, we, we think we're worried that we'd be called weird if we ask for that. Um, but in the, in, the, in the Muslim world, um, you know, that people also have this acute need, which isn't necessarily being addressed by agencies, um, particularly health providing agencies. Uh, and so there is a responsibility for our Muslim mental health colleagues who have um, knowledge, religious knowledge to, for us to come together. I mean, I'm not a mental health professional, but I've recognized um, the essential element of it around healing, post-traumatic healing, um, from experience. Um, and so, you know, one of the last things I do <laughs> in the aid world is I would like to see an initiative um, recognized um, as and going forward around this. Uh, and I think Islamic League would be willing to support this um, in any way we can. So as a w w way of encouragement to some of our, our colleagues on the call. I, I would like to just say, I, I appreciate what you're saying. I've, I've been mostly based in Europe for over 30, well, almost 35 years, but um, but in the U US or North America and, and other places, I think there is a renaissance of interest in spirituality, but not necessarily in faith practices. And I distinguish those two because it is the, you know, the faith, the actual faith as it is lived out. So there's a lot of popular spiritual, but it doesn't go as far. And I agree with you within the context of the UN and other agencies, um, 
there, there is not an understanding and it is sometimes, it is the beneficiaries who bring it to the fore, as you say, the spiritual need. Uh, and as they want to work with local faith actors, they, they have to learn a new vocabulary and not just, you know, tick off the box, but to really understand the, uh, the worldview of that they're entering when they enter a culture and how that is how that affects everything that people see and and um, and in life and how they deal with life. So we have a lot to do in terms of learning each other's vocabulary, I guess, within development within humanitarian space. But we have a long way to go. But I I yeah I started to distinguish faith, and I appreciate that the Joint Learning Initiative says faith <laughs> because sometimes this quote, spiritual is so watered down that it, 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 it doesn't really, you know, it, it's like the faith is frowned upon, the spiritual is embraced, but we need to research the evidence for the, the faith-based practices that bring resilience and they're there in the communities. We, we need to, to, to demonstrate that. So yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Uh, uh, I, I want to comment just as I understand from your question on the chat uh, uh, and you ask about if this uh, topic has been studied in the Arabic world or Arabic psychology. Now, unfortunately, we don't uh, really have an Arabic psychology or, or like a genuine work uh, that comes from our, it is all, all what we have is just something that and echo to what's happening in the West. This is first. Second, actually, I start to think, how can we apply that? Or who, who we can find that they have this spiritual problem when they do things, or faith problem, when they do things against their beliefs. So what I'm thinking is, first, uh, some uh, radical groups who start to do things, and then they repent and come back. So how they think about that? And also people who also related to regimes who oppress, pe oppress people, and then they defect after that. So how they will feel about that? This is very interesting, actually. And this is one idea that maybe we, we need for long term to think about how to explore it. But again, the problem is the basic in including faith with our communities is lacking. Like even, uh, I, I say this uh, over and over, in Northwest Syria, where the mental health professionals and the uh, beneficiaries share the same religion, the same sect, the same culture, the same language, they are not able to provide any spiritual or faith or religious activities or interventions because they fear of like neutrality and all other things, right? So the basic we don't have in this regard. So actually we have a long way to go actually on this topic. And we hope that our work is like just open the door or trigger some thinking to change the mind and paradigm of all stakeholders. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Um, and I'm loving how um, engaged the discussion here is. It's great. That's exactly what we were hoping for, weren't we, um, Mohammed? Um, for this for this webinar, um, the majority of um, people on the call, um, from what I see, are actually from Syria. Um, and I just wanted to remind you that um, we would love to hear from you as well. Um, don't worry if you don't feel comfortable speaking in English. That's absolutely fine. If you have any comments um, to make about what has been said or um, maybe there's something that we haven't talked about yet, but that is experience, that is important from your experience. If you have any questions um, for our speakers, feel free to just ask your questions in Arabic. Um, the interpretation is happening in the background. So um, we, hopefully this will help reduce the language barrier as much as possible. Yeah, yeah so please colleagues. Oh. We are encouraging now, if you want to ask any questions, 
Yeah, either serious or non serious, but yeah, if any question, I think we have a few minutes left. Uh, so, uh, so our translate uh, interpreters not be tired. So, if you will have any comments or question, yeah, uh, yeah, we few minutes left. Uh, I was just I going to. I, I noticed in the chat um, yeah. somebody was asking about the um, face sensitive uh, guide to uh, mental health in humanitarian situations and wondering whether it can be shared. What is the best way to share it? I have it online, and Mohammed. I think you have it in Arabic now. Yes, uh, I, I put the, the, the link. Right, I just okay, that's fine, the sorry, link. I didn't say that, yeah. Yeah, so so, so I, I will put again the link here. Uh, so this is the, no, not this one. Yeah, Amr, do you have just put the rabbit that I put in the Okay. Uh, somebody wanted to speak? Yeah, it's me. Yeah, Sana, go ahead. Hi, Dr. Muhammad. Thank you so much for this invitation. It was a really interesting topic to talk about. I just like have uh, like an article that I would like to share. The, the, uh, the conference was about uh, Syrian uh, psychologists. It seems like we don't like put an effort in this, um, this way, but what sometimes makes us like be careful when we don't have like a clear guideline or written guideline or like topic, we 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 are be careful to push people to use virtual uh, um, concepts in the therapy or the psychosocial support because the sessions sometimes go to other to other way to be like just advice and people feel really disappointed because they cannot handle the 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 too much. Um, they they feel overwhelmed sometimes if you cannot like use the special side with the psychotherapy and like me the marriage to two concepts together and consider the background of the client because the client is mostly uh, are not like um, well educated and sometimes we need like uh, supervision in the Syrian environment so all these um, factors makes the thing, things more complicated. Even when we go to the Western countries, we are like, be careful using the spiritual side with psychotherapy, even we, uh, if we have this courage like to, to use it, but we need always to think about it before the session, prepare ourselves very well and like read a lot about it, even if it's like our religion and we have like this experience, but we have like to consider when exactly and make the rationale about using the spiritual side with the psychotherapy. I think this this thing like need to cooperate with many psychologists working on the in the in the same field and have the courage like to do some research about this. And I think this conference is really open uh, a good opportunity to go further. So I'd like to thank you all and I, I like that so I'm interested to be in contact with many of you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Sana. Thank you very much for your contribution. And yes, you are correct. So always, whatever we do, especially things that are uh, new. Uh, yes, uh, things are new. Always there's a potential that there's a harm, right? Uh, and this is what we are saying. This is a complex matter. You need flexibility, we need a collective effort, so we can start working on that. And we will find the challenge, we will find the challenges, right? We will find uh, 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 negative practices, right? But if you don't, if we don't start in the first place, we will, we will not find these and we will not classify them and we will not find solution for them. So you are right, and uh, thank you for you know, uh, uh, joining us actually in, in, in this efforts. And we need uh, collective efforts, like uh, Brother Atallah said. We need to have a coalition in all different parts of the world <clears throat> to, okay. to, to, to work uh, on this matter. Uh, Atallah, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to add, it. this is a, a very good point, uh, Sana, you made 
Um, I, I know my wife was trained as a psychotherapist and she is also trained in doing Islamic counseling. Um, and she, she's kind of, there's a critical point at which you understand, you need to understand when the person requires some Islamic counseling and when they just need some other type of counseling or pastoral support and listening to. And that, I guess, is you know part of the training of psychotherapists, or at least uh, in in being faith literate. Um, because if you are a secular person, um, or you may well not pick that up, or you may pick it up, but you may not be able to deal with it. So I, I'm really interested in working with people like yourselves and uh, Dr. Mohammed you know, who are trained um, in psychology or psychiatry to actually develop a course around Islamic counselling, uh, which would enable um, Muslim psychotherapists and possibly non-Muslim as well, because I found that non-Muslims, uh, as Michelle, and, and, you know, was able to talk about this concept of moral in injury, you know, there's there's different language, there's different terms that are used in different cultural and religious contexts to describe the same thing. Um, but there's there's a there's a need within the Muslim world for, you know, traditionally trained psychotherapists and psychiatrists to be sensitized to the power and importance of Islamic counselling when it's required um, and, and to understand when it is required. And I suppose that's the critical point. That is what makes somebody a true professional in this context is when they can are able to recognise, you know, exactly what therapy is required uh, and then be able to supply it. And if they can't supply it, refer it to somebody who they, they trust can supply it. Because as, as uh, Sana said, you know, there, there can be a lot of harm um, transmitted as well if it's done unprofessionally uh, over. Thank you, Atallah. The good thing is Sana is near you. She is in UK. So maybe we will try to connect her with you and maybe help or to, to be joining this efforts. And now, Jennifer, I think we need to uh, wrap up and finish because time is like over. So uh, floor is yours, Jennifer. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so um, I mean, I don't think there's much left to say. Well, there's a lot left to say, um, but we'll keep that for another day. Um, just um just a massive thank you um to especially our speakers of course um so muhammad atalla and everyone who um has joined us today who has um, contributed to the discussion or who was sitting there listening and taking in um all of the information that was shared it was an absolute pleasure to be here with you today um we will of course uh, continue the work inshallah um, so if you um, if you're interested in um, in being involved, if you're interested in um, in staying in touch, um, you can actually if you go to the JLI website, you can um, sign up to join um, and it's for free. It doesn't cost anything. Um, I'm just looking up the link for the MHPSS hub. So the hub um, itself is, of course, only um, open for Syrians and all activities are in Arabic. Um, but if you're not Syrian um, and you don't speak Arabic, but you would still um, like to be involved um, and benefit, then you can sign up any, anyway and apply to join the Global Partnership Group. Because we have the hub um, um, that is um, led by Syrians. And then... Um, yeah, the global partnership group for friends and colleagues from um, other parts of the world and 
for example, today on the call, we had, I saw at least two um, colleagues. I saw Fabian, and then there was Mohammed um, um, Akasabi, who is also, who are both um, members of the partnership group. So yeah, please be in touch. Um, and um, yeah, I hope you enjoy the rest of your days. Um, happy iftar for those of you who are fasting. Um, it's just a few more hours now, I think. Um, depending on where in the world you are. And see you soon, inshallah. Yeah. See you thank soon. you and bless you for bringing us together, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you, Atallah. Thank you, everybody, for attendance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.